Please turn to Proverbs chapter 17, verse 13, and then a second portion of the scripture, we're going to 1 Samuel 24. So Proverbs 17, verse 13, and 1 Samuel 24. As you turn there, there's something that, that we, you know, I, I try to reflect on the life of David and think, man, what a great, great man of God. So with, with his greatness and what God has done in his life and what an inspiration it is to us, we look at his life, especially as a young man, and think, my goodness, what, what, a, what a young man that was so outstanding. But yet you think about the preparation that God made with him in, in keep, keeping of sheep, playing a harp, and not, being, and not his mind being invaded by all different types of information from every direction. We, we look at someone's greatness as they walk with God, but we, we don't really give reflection on the time that they spent with the Lord. Proverbs 17, 13 says, Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. One of the greatest illustrations that we see in the Bible in to illustrate this portion of Scripture, whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house, is the issue with uh, Saul and his dealing with, king, or with dealing with David, the future king. Look at me in 1 Samuel 24 in verse 1. So what is the setting to give us an illustration, whoso rewardeth evil for good, Evil shall not depart from his house. The setting is this. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Enjedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. David had done nothing amiss to King Saul. David had not risen his hand against the king. Yet the king is so jealous, he's so maddening, his, his jealousy is so maddening that he's willing to commit murder because of, because of it. The circumstances we see in verse 3, and he came to the sheep coats by the way where it was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. So King Saul comes in to go to sleep, but they're in the same cave. Now you, you live in West Virginia, all over America as we would say, but you, you certainly no doubt maybe have been in a cave in your life. And you know that caves have an unbelievable echoing system. So all these men in the sides of the cave, now how far back the Bible didn't say, maybe they were so far back you couldn't hear them. But every cave I've, been, I've ever been in, is that it's either total silence in the area where I am, or you can hear things a long, long way off. So as they realize that, hey, King Saul and his men are in the same cave, I mean, that, the, just the urgency of, uh, oh my goodness, what's going on, is quite amazing. Simply because we understand how sound travels through a cave. But David had the opportunity for vengeance. Remember our text of verse, it says, Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. David had played a harp and played the harp for King Saul to help King Saul. But that didn't help. David had been a hero on, on the battlefield for Israel, but Saul didn't care. In 1 Samuel 24, I want you to look with me in verse 4 of what it says, that the opportunity for him to strike back. In verse 4, the Bible said to the men of David, said unto him, Behold the day which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. So he had an opportunity for, for vengeance. And so what he does is this. David goes up and cut, cut, cuts the king's robe but I want to invite you to verse 5. And it came to the past after that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. Saul was wrong. He was wrong. And, and here's, here's what David had. David had the opportunity to seek vengeance on Saul and to kill him. 
And that's what his men were encouraging him to do. Those that have good intentions, some of their encouragements might, might, might not be God's will. So you better, you better weigh what's God's will versus what someone's good advice is. Right? But David, here's what I see about this. That David also had an opportunity for vengeance, but he also had a to, uh, an opportunity for total reliance upon God. But that happened because of David's sensitivity. You see what it says here. In, in verse 5, and it came to pass after that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. Just the hem of his garment and it, his heart smote him with conviction. The words, listen, the, the word of God, the promises of God, the anointing that, that he had seen in his own life of Samuel anointing him king. And, and here he, he could not bring his hand against King Saul, even though Saul was wrong in, in many, if not all, respects. David would not lay his hand against God's anointed. Now, look at me in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24, and notice what it says. In f- chapter 24, verse 6, And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. You know what David was saying? Yep, he's the anointed of the Lord, but I'm going to let God take care of it. I'm not going to try to do it myself. In Proverbs chapter 17, verse 13, the Bible said, Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. When, When David was confronted with almost the same circumstances, go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 9, 10, 11, and 12. David is confronted with the same opportunity. Okay, well, it happened the first time. I didn't take, I didn't take vengeance. I just relied on the Lord. And you, you know what? Most people would say, well, here it is again. Here, here. Obviously, I missed it. Well, that's where we better not miss the direction of the Holy Spirit of God. We better not miss the direction of God's will because that opportunity where you need to rely upon God may come up a second time. You know what our nature is. Our nature is to say, well, I didn't take care of it the first time, and here it is again. Now I'm going to now I'm gonna deal with it, right? Yeah. 1 Samuel 26, verse 9. And David said to Abishai, destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or as his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed, but I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water, and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they got him away, and no man saw it, nor knew it. Neither awake, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. That, that's what's amazing. God so intervenes that they're all asleep. David could have do, done whatever he wanted to do with the king. It's of, God's, it, it's of God's direction to provide this opportunity. But it's David's wisdom and his sensitivity to say, it's not my battle. It's God's battle, and God's got to take care of him. I'm not going to deal with him. Friend, let us learn from that. We need to be very careful how we deal with one another. In 1 Peter, look with me if you would, uh, and let's go here. 1 Peter. Now, you, maybe you've had somebody trying to chase you and kill you. I, I understand that there's, everybody's not immune to the things that we discuss here in church as for different situations, and, and I understand that. But that's not, we're, we're not talking about our situations. We're talking about what God did in the life of David. What we can learn from that is the fact that, hey, I, I, I need to be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God, that God lead me and help me even when, even when something shows its face twice. I do not need to be seeking vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. God will take care of our enemies. God tells us to love our enemies, and that's an amazing statement there, isn't it? But it would take incredible, would you, would you come to an agreement with me today that it would take incredible faith and courage and strength not to strike against Saul? 
First Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Bible said, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. But our text verse, listen, our text verse says this. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. So someone does good to you, you do evil back. Listen to 1 Peter 3, 9 again. Not rendering evil for evil. Well, there's justification. No, it isn't. Evil for evil, not, uh, nor, or, nor, or railing for railing. Well, he said this, so I said this to him. Sometimes we just need to be quiet and let God take care of it. But contrarywise, blessing, knowing that you are there to call, that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days. All right, listen, listen. You want to love life and see good days? Is that what you want? Well, sure. Now, notice what it says. Let him refrain his tongue from evil, and that his lips, they speak no guile. You know what guile is? Basically talking trash about people. Guile is something reprehensible and talking smack, talking trash about people. We shouldn't do that. Notice what it says. Let him eschew evil. That means turn it off and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. See, the commandments for Christians goes even further in our behavior. Look at me in 1 Thessalonians, and if you don't know where that is, look in the table of contents. In the New Testament, you'll see 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Please turn there to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 15. First Thessalonians 5.15. What's our text verse say in Proverbs? Whoso rendereth evil for, evil, uh, evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 See that none render evil for evil unto any man. Forever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. It doesn't mean that the Bible's teaching against self-defense. That's not what it's talking about. I have a right to defend myself. But, but uh, however, there are times when you and not mo most of the confrontations that we ever get in is all verbal, right? It's all verbal. It's interpersonal stuff. And a lot of times we, ju we just need to obey the Lord and not render evil for evil just because somebody said something wicked to us. Romans chapter 12, verse 17, please. Go there. Romans 12, 17. Verse 17 and verse 18. I like verse 16. The very last uh, sentence says, Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. And, but, but, but here's the key. If it be possible, as such as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And some people, it's not possible. Why? Because they don't want to be at peace with you. So if someone doesn't want to be at peace with you, are you going to live at peace with them? Well, I guess I can because I can, I can choose to take the highway of peace, but yet they're always going to be hostile. Well, that's their choice. I can, do, I can only do what God's told me to do, and then I can only do what God allows me to, to, to do, and I can only love someone that acts like that because of what God is in my own life to be able to respond to people properly. What we say to people could last for decades. Are we right on that? Decades. We need to be very careful what we say. And we're all guilty. Look at me in 1 Peter chapter 2, because God will take care of us. 1 Peter chapter 2, and look at me in verse 21. Okay, so in verse 21, for even here and two were you called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Whether it's what we talked about in Sunday school about walk, coming up to the wilderness, well, maybe God led you to the wilderness because he knows what needs to be built in your life. 
We're all in a building process where God's trying to help us to be more of a perfect man, not mean we're sinless, but more to a mature, perfect man that I'm able to live life in victory and, and not be inundated or, or ta- entangled with the affairs of this life. But I want you to go back with me to 1 Samuel as we try to round the wagons and close the message. And I want you to notice something that the Bible said in 1 Samuel 26. If there's anyone I would want standing by side my side, unless I was Uriah the Hittite, it would be King David. That, that's who I would want standing beside me because he had a great disdain for those people that did not take care of their duties. In 1 Samuel 26 and verse 15, the Bible said, And David said to Abner, Art not thou a valiant man? This is, this is the king's bodyguard. And who is likened to thee in Israel? David's getting ready to give him a verbal punch right in the teeth. Hey, you see what he said? Art, art, art not thou a valiant man? And who is likened to thee or, or, or like to thee in Israel? Well, for then hast thou not kept the Lord thy king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king my, thy Lord. Verse 16, please. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, you are worthy to die because... Ye have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the cruise of water that was at his bolster. Verse 18 through 20 gives the expression of David's humility. His humility in the, in the face of being done wrong. Now, that takes great strength for us to say, I'm gonna, even though I've been wrong, I'm going to be humble, not hostile. What, what has hostility ever, ever done to help me in dealing with the interpersonal problem? Nothing. But David's humility in the face of great wrong, wrongdoing is a great example for us. Verse 18 through 20. So I'm going to ask someone, Brother Elijah Dean, could you read 1 Samuel uh, 26, verse 18? Brother Tracy King, could you read verse 19? And Brother Willie Jefferson, could you read verse 20? So I'm going to have these three men read this. David's humility in the face of great wrongdoing. Verse 18, please. You know, sometimes very calm honesty, very calm biblical response to a problem is very convicting. You, you know you're talking about a man that's trying to murder him for no other reason other than jealousy and insanity. I mean, I mean and to, to, to put up with someone treating you in a wrong manner, whether it be verbally, I'm not talking about physical stuff, you have law enforcement take care of that. But, 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 and, and, or an issue where you need to self, you need to defend yourself. But here's what I'm trying to say. When someone is confrontational with you, sometimes very quietly, humble speaking to them brings great conviction in their life because they know they're wrong in doing what they're doing anyway. First Samuel 26, verse 21. And look at the admission of the adversary. The Bible said, then said Saul, I have what? That's how you confess your sin. Not I apologize, not I'm sorry. He didn't get much right, but he got that statement right. I have sinned. And what did he say? I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul, that, that my soul was precious in thine eyes today. But I, behold, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. So what that calm response did and not violence, what it did was bring Saul to an admission of his guilt. First Samuel 26, 22. And David answered and said, Behold the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. See, here's the thing. When, when you look at a spear and you look at the king, it would be a disgrace in front of the troops for the king to be disarmed. I mean, that is disgraceful for somebody to disarm you. 
But David, David's, David's honor, his honor was just beyond reproach. And he tells the king, hey, you, you have one of your guys come over here and fetch his spear. He gave back that symbol of power to the king. What, what a man of God. Verse 23, the Lord render every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into mine hand today, but I would not stretch forth thine hand against the Lord's anointed. 1 Samuel 24, 17. 1 Samuel 24, 17, please. First Samuel twenty four seventeen. And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I rewarded thee what? What does the text verse say in Proverbs seventeen thirteen? Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. Last verse. 1 Samuel 31, verse 2 and verse 3. 1 Samuel 31, verse 2 and verse 3. David said, hey, his time will come to die, but it's not my job to lay my hand against God's anointed. 1 Samuel 31, verse 2 and verse 3. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And this is what's so sad. It's heartbreaking. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchushua, Saul's sons. Now, I was thinking about how Saul would feel if he saw his own kids slaughtered in battle. He said, I've sinned, David. I rewarded your good with evil. God said, if you do that, evil is not going to depart from your house. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. Be careful, little hands, what you do. Every head bowed, every eye closed.